All righty. Well, if you're ready, I will admit everyone. Sure. Okay, here we go. Admit all. No, I'm joyous, I think. You can. Well, hello, everybody. It's two o'clock, and we are super excited. <laughs> this is Zoom meeting number one. <laughs> so I would like to thank all of you, and it says that there's a whole bunch of you, 70. That's more than we could get in the carriage house. So wow. sorry. Yeah, so I would like to... I would like to remind everybody for right now, let's mute our microphones. So there's no feedback from everybody. And then um, what we'll do is, is if you have a question, if you type it in the chat, we have co-hosts. I have Mitch here from us who's with us. And then we have Justin from HPL Programming. And I would like to thank HPL Programming and Mitch and everybody involved in getting us into the 21st century. Yay, okay. And bringing everybody here, because I know that everybody is going through withdrawals, being here at the library, and we're going through withdrawals and not seeing everybody. So we're really excited about being able to do this. So we are doing this on the fourth Friday of every month. And um, next month, Mitch is doing a presentation on um, 20, a mobile communication, mobile, com mobile computing, m mobile genealogy apps. And then, and then Franklin Smith is doing another one on using, in September, on using our five senses for family history research. So we're pretty excited about doing this. So let's get started. Um, this is our first slide. And I wanted to mention that the, we the, are chat, here. the chat is disabled. Okay, the chat is disabled somehow, so my, my co-host will work on that. Thank you. Um, uh, if you need the chat, you can see it in the bar that's down on the bottom. There's a little chat, little two little, little, little um, icons, yeah, conversation boxes. Anyway, so this slide will be at the end of the slide also, at the end of our presentation also, because it has ways that you can contact us. It has our email reference, it has our phone number, it has a way to get a library card in case you need a library card for some of that remote access. And then we also would like to mention that we can do Zoom meetings for your groups. So call us and we are ready to do those Zoom meetings for you also. So let's get started now and see how we go along with this. Today we're talking about unusual resources beyond the well-known resources. And these are things that, um, that are beyond that pedigree chart because that pedigree chart does not tell the family story. The pedigree chart gives us the names, the dates, and the places, but it's those dashes that we're really trying to fill in to give that family story because a pedigree chart, let's face it, is boring. The story is what's interesting. The story is what makes the memories and the story is what helps us pass those family histories down. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about a number of just a few sources today. We're going to talk about delinquent, defective, and dependent censuses and records for those that have been afflicted by something that might we might not consider afflictions now. Um, oh, I took away, I'm sorry, I took away the unusual coding on the death certificate. Ugh, I didn't take this off the slide. So let me tell you, just quickly, <laughs> if you come across a code, a code number on a death certificate instead of a cause of the death certificate, those are the codes that they use for medical coding. And at the end of the presentation, I will pull up that website because I took that off this PowerPoint, I'm sorry. We're gonna talk about the Work Progress Administration and we're gonna talk about periodicals and then how you can have your own research library at home, okay? So I hope you come away thinking, hmm, that's some wonderful stuff that we can have. Um, I will also at the end of the presentation put the link to the handouts for this presentation because I did not do this prior to so these are notes that we're taking and I really appreciate you guys bearing with us <laughs> in our first Zoom meeting. Let's talk about delinquent and dependent information and the 1880 census. When we look at the regular federal, federal population census, we notice that there are special columns. 1880 is a special census because you might be familiar with the manufacturing and the agricultural censuses which is extended censuses from the federal population census. Agriculture manufacturing is 1850 through 1910. The defective delinquent and dependent census information is 1880 only. However, because we're good researchers, we just don't look at the names on the census sheets and there were questions asked in different censuses in variant years. So in 1880, you will find columns in those census sheets, whether somebody was deaf, dumb, blind, or insane. You can see in 1880, there were these special health columns, and I have examples of that. And then also, you can see in 1890, there were fragments, but whether they were suffering from acute or chronic diseases, further on in the 1890 census, they asked if they were defective in mind, whether they were crippled. All this information should lead you to further documents, should lead you to try and find maybe medical records. 1900, they didn't ask any health affliction questions. 1910, whether they were blind, and you can see 1920, 1930, 1940, they did not ask any of those health questions. But it's a lesson in looking at each census and looking at all those columns because as in 1930, they asked whether there was military service. So don't get focused just on that name. Look at all the columns. On Ancestry at Ancestry.com and Ancestry.com is now available through the library through August 31st. There are only about 18 states digitized of this 1880 defective delinquent independent census. Other censuses for different states could reside at state archives. They could re reside at state universities. There are some that have not been digitized and some that have been transcribed also. So Ancestries does not have them all, neither does Family Search. So they are somewhat difficult to find, but if you find them, they're really interesting. So this is an example from 1880 from Texas, from Bear County for Casper Tuttock. And see, we can see Casper here at the top. We see that he's a son. We see that he is a farmer. He's about 20 years old. But then also, if we look, here's the columns, there is a hash mark right there. He is deaf and dumb. He was birth, born in Texas. Both his parents were born in Prussia, and we see that further on. But this is 1880, and here's these columns right there. So what we do then is, is this is the actual regular census for 1880 for Bear County. What we're going to do then is, is we're going to try and find the defective delinquent and dependent census for Bear County. One of the things I also wanted to mention was, is you do need to note see this column right here. This is the family number and the dwelling number. 
you're going to watch these numbers because these numbers transfer over into these other special censuses, whether they're the agriculture manufacturing or the defective delinquent independent census. So if we look at the next slide, we see Casper Tuttick here. And here he is in St. Halgwig in Bear County. Whoops, I'm sorry. Is he or she self-supporting? Yes. Supposed cause of deafness from cramps and age at with the deafness occurred, one year. So we're learning more about that just from that one column. And since it was 1880, we can find that deliquid, de deliquid, defective delinquent independent census to get more information about the affliction, which fills in the family story. Moving on to the next slide, which is why I can see, okay. And then we also see that he was in the Austin Institute. He was there for two years and he went in in November of, 17, of, of 1877. So we have other information that gives us more of the family history. We can look and see if there's Austin institutional records. We know that institutional records are difficult. They might be some at the state archives. There might be personnel information or people information. But even if we knew nothing else and found no other records, we know more about Casper than when we started just by looking in the federal population census. There are also listings for prisons. Now, again, note the column. Now, we know that the prisons are listed in the actual federal population census. But again, because this is this special census, it's giving more information. It's giving us the person's name, the county that they were from, the place of imprisonment. But then there are also these really interesting columns, I think, that are part of this special census, the special enumeration that was extracted from the federal census. What type of prisoner? Is it a United States prisoner, a state prisoner, or just a city prisoner? That's going to indicate where those court records might be. Was it a federal, what is it a federal crime, a state crime, or a city crime? Are you going to look for court records at the city level, the state level, or the federal level? Are they awaiting trial? Are they serving a term of imprisonment? This is the one you want. Are they awaiting execution? Because think of the newspaper articles that might be developed out of that, okay? Being held as a witness, is this person being imprisoned for, de for debt? Is this person imprisoned for insanity? The date of incarceration. There's your date looking forwards and backwards for court records and newspaper documents. And so like I mentioned, they are within the normal prison within the normal county records of the 1880 census. But again, this is more information that's leading you to fill out the family stories. This is the state lunatic assignment. So some of the columns here are history of the attack, the duration of the attack, the number of attacks that they had, the age at onset, is the person kept in a cell? Is the person restrained? Is the person been in a hospital, what hospital, and then the total length of time in that hospital or that institution. So again, these are only 1880, but they're giving us that family history rather than just that genealogy and that pedigree chart. So these are digitized images. Some of them are at Ancestry. Some of them are at state, state archives, at county archives, at state universities. You really have to dig for these, but they're rich in information and, of course, can take you down another rabbit trail in your family history because we know that you don't have enough of those. Okay? So there. <laughs> if I look at family search and I use the family search catalog, which is really important to use too, I'm using a keyword search. So I'm looking at 1880 defective. So I go to family search, I go into my account and I click on catalog and I use a keyword search. What comes up is other supplemental material that there are 19 results and I'm looking at, we can see the 1880 federal census, defendant, defective delinquent and dependent classes. These are mostly books. There's a non-population census schedule for Tennessee. We have to open up that record and make sure it's just not the agricultural and the manufacturing. 
But then there's also this defective dependent and delinquent schedule 1880 for Jackson County, Missouri. And what that brings up is when I click on that, it brings up the record. And as we look at the record on Family Search, it says to view a digital version of this item, click here. So there is a book, the defective delinquent independence schedule. So not use so using not only ancestry for those records, but then also going into family search and see what kind of books have been digitized. Also, if you look, I did a keyword just for the word defective. You can see over on the left side, you have to be creative in these keywords, blind, deaf, insane. It'll bring up material. And here is physically defective handicapped admission records from 1910 to 1944 from Yorkshire. But what happened is, is it is the dreaded, oh, I can't see these images at home. But we are a Family Search affiliate library. So if when you're using Family Search and you come across images that says these images are available at a Family Search library, you are going to want to send us an email. You're going to want to call us on the phone because we are an affiliate library. We can go into that record. You'll, you'll have to give us the full information of the title of the, of the information that you're looking for and things like that. But we can work with you on the phone and we can send you those images. So don't feel as if once you go into family search and you, you wish that we were open for restricted images, call us and we can work with you with those restricted images. Additionally, there's a, a website that a lot of people forget about. I forget about it often, the US Gen Web. The US Gen Web is a geographic driven uh, website, which has just all kinds of stuff on it because it is a volunteer website. And for Ohio, for Monroe County, within that is the number of deaf, dumb, blind, and insane and idiotic persons. So someone has gone in and transcribed that. And the website is just the usgenweb.com or .org. And it's just go into your, into your state. There's also an international part too. So use that US Gen Web because this kind of information, the deaf, dumb, blind, insane, and idiotic persons is really the kind of information that doesn't get in any place else any place else because it's not low hanging fruit. So you're looking tr for transcriptions, you're looking for books to help you out with those. So, and then, I'm sorry, you just could you mute please? The other thing would be WorldCat. WorldCat is a worldwide library catalog. And again, it's all about the search terms. It's all about those keywords that you're using. Remember there's a difference between a keyword search and a title search. A keyword search, the word's gonna be inside the description, could be anywhere. The title search means it needs to be in a title. So you're gonna to wanna to search state census records, county clerk blind, feeble-minded, all those words to get information in WorldCat. And it is a library catalog, so it will take you to where the library what books, what libraries have the books or the images, and then you might need to contact them or there might be digital images. I just did South Dakota Department of, I did a search for blind South Dakota and up came in a keyword, there's South Dakota Department of History state census records from 1935 that include a question of whether they have an affliction. Additionally, this is from Kalamazoo County Clerk in that, again, using Wisconsin, deaf, Wisconsin blind, nationality, pauperism is another word, idiotic, insane, all those keywords are gonna get you these records and then you can identify if they've been digitized to family search or if you need to contact a genealogy society or how you can get those. Also annual reports, this time period, this is just the Massachusetts School for Idiotic and Feeble-Minded in WorldCat. Those keywords are super important because you're going to get more broader of a search. And then also, if you're not familiar with the card catalog at Ancestry or actually the um, card catalog at uh, the way to search at Family Search, but at Ancestry, if you click on search, there's a drop down menu that says card catalog and you can do a, a, a keyword search or a title search. In Family Search, when you click on the word research, or historical collections, there's a place there also to search by keyword. There happens to be a special census of deaf and family marriages of hearing relatives for that time period in ancestry. So those weird keywords are super important to use 
when you're looking for afflictions. Next thing I want to talk about is the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, the Works Project Administration. People were put together to work with during the New Deal. There are federal records that were created by the Works Progress Administration. There are also state records. There are also level, uh, local level records because the WPA worked at the state level, the local level, and the federal level, putting people back to work and putting in progress, in, pro in, in, in putting people back to work so they could bring in money because we were in the middle of the depression. So there were also local histories, oral histories, and historical record surveys. One of the things that's kind of interesting is, was that the WPA had, was the Pack Horse Library Initiative, which, drove, which rode horses deep into Appalachia in Kentucky, and it was implemented by the WPA and to distribute over 10,000 miles, square miles, backwards area, books to these Appalachian families. This area, you know, in this area in Kentucky had, was, it didn't have much electricity, they didn't have highways, they were living in Appalachia. So all the electricity was lacking, education, food, but books were also lacking. In 1930, 31% couldn't read. There were previous attempts to bring reading material out into Kentucky in 1913 by a woman whose name was Mary Stafford, and then there was also a college that also sent book wagons out into the mountains. But in 1934, the WPA sponsored these pack horse librarians and initially was formed in Leslie County. But it was also part of a community help. The community really got involved because they had to be outposts where books were stored and then the riders went out. They went out at least twice a month with each route covering about 100 to 120 miles a week. There was a woman whose name was Nan Milan who carried books in an eight mile radius from the Pine Mountain Settlement School, which was a boarding school for mountain children. And then she would ride and find these families. And she also joked that her horse must have short legs on one side than the other, so it wouldn't slide down the mountain. They earned $28 a month, which was about $495 in current money. They served over 50,000 librarians and by 1937, 155 public schools. Children loved the program since a lot of the mountain schools didn't have libraries and they would cry, bring me a book to read, bring me a book to read. And the Pack Horse Library ended in 1943 after Franklin Roosevelt ordered the end of the WPA because the new war effort was putting people back to work. And then of course, motorized Bookmobiles came along in the 40s, and then uh, public libraries in Kentucky now have 75 bookmobiles and can serve, the, can serve the citizens of Kentucky. But this was one thing, and the point of this story is, it's a woman who did a job in the WPA. So how can we find out more about her through some records and we can get back, we can get back stories on the horseback riding, but the National Archives, because the WPA was an initial federal government project. So I went to the National Archives and I typed in horseback librarians, just to, just to see what happened. Up in the upper right hand corner, I know it might be kind of small. So up came some discussion on this history hub, okay? So the History Cub actually is a platform, it's a crowdsourcing platform that's provided by the National Archives to bring together people with interests and also to maybe do some citizen archivist training. Um, and so they have blogs and community pages. So again, it's crowdsourcing. So I thought, okay, so there's pack horse libraries in Rowan, Rowan County, Kentucky. But somebody from named Andrew Begley answered, Okay, and he talked about that there are state reports and then narrative reports and the, where they can be found. So since there are state reports, we now know that there, there are state levels and things like that. So the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, when we think of the National Personnel Records Center, we often think of just military personnel records. But people were involved and were paid by the federal government and this is the Personnel Records Center for the federal government. It is a central repository of personnel records 
related records for military and civil services of the United States as part of the National Archives. So you can go to the National Archives, which is archives.gov and find the National Personnel Records Center. When I get you the links for the handouts, you'll, it's on the handout, the information's on the handout. There are state reports also at the National Archives and we can see they might not be available online, but there are personnel records for those that were employed by the federal government. And you can find out more information about them and then also the WPA. The WPA also, <clears throat> they hired workers and craftsmen who were mainly employed in building streets. But they created a lot of other things other than sending horses and building lodges and things like that. They also created this thing called the Inventory of County Archives. So what's important to know that this inventory was done in the 1930s, but if you're looking for records at the county level, you can find that in fact, there were sheriff's records, there were circuit court records that were held at the county level in Illinois for, what county was this that I pulled? This is Knox County, which is Galesburg. Okay, so this is a beginning where you can look at these inventory records. They're invent some of these records are available digitally at the national at the at the Internet Archive, which is archive.org. No s archive.org. The National Archives is archives.gov. Right, but you can see some of these, and then that should lead you to the county courthouse to say, do you still have these records? or where are these records? These records actually existed in these county courthouses. One of the other projects that they did, of course, was they built miles and millions of miles of streets, bridges, airports. The largest single project was the WPA, of the WPA was the Tennessee Valley Authority, which provided the impoverished Tennessee Valley with dams and waterworks to create an infrastructure. They had, they built Camp David they also helped build this, the Golden Gate Bridge. There was also something called the National Youth Administration between 1935 and 1945 when it, was, when it was abandoned. But again, this was also helping youth have jobs. The, and one project, which was the federal project number one, the WPA employed musicians, artists, writers, actors, and directors. Didn't we hear about Bielski's son, did he? You guys, go in the somebody, hospital somebody, and somebody's uh, talking, you guys. Somebody's talking and not But he was definitely positive. Thanks. <laughs> so the WPA had musicians and they had directors, but they were the Federal Writers Project, which wrote about history of states and then also created other, doc, other plays and things like that. Also the Historical Records Survey, which is part of this county records, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Music Project, and the Federal Art Project. So you can find information about artists and musicians, and the Historical Records Survey was one of the, also included the um, slave narratives and the slave, the slave documents. So many former slaves were interviewed and they are of great importance to American history. Theater and music groups were interviewed, archeological investigations. So you really should investigate the WPA and if your family had anybody that worked in there, there's also the CCC, which is something else and all these federal programs and trying to find records about what your family did and documents that can give you more of a story. WorldCat again, when I do, when I did it, I did a search just for Work Progress Administration, and in there I found, <coughs> excuse me, documents that include historical development of Westchester, the WPA in New York, but also if you notice over on the left-hand side, there's options to choose from to limit down your searches. I mean, I have 219,000 results. If I limit the searches down to downloadable visual material, <coughs> excuse me, digital images, sidewalks completed by WPA in Louisiana. These are downloaded visual images. One of the things I found was the National Conservation, this is from the um, National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. 
And there is three work progress administration employees. This is in the upper Mississippi Valley in the upper Mississippi River. And further on down that image is a link from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to the National Digital Library of this picture of these three guys building part of a road. Now, unfortunately, in the description of the picture, these guys are not identified. But again, there's visual material that you can find, there's book material and other things, all about the WPA. So how, what did your ancestor do? What did your relative do? What did they do? What can you find out about it? And how can you fill in that story to fill in those dashes on that pedigree chart? And what kind of supplemental material can you find? So let's talk about periodicals really quick. I wanna talk about those. If you are not using genealogy magazines, genealogy periodicals, you could be missing a lot. They tend to abstract in and index and transcribe records of the regions where they're published, but then also material gets into a, ma a genealogy magazine that is not even related to the area that the information was published. And we'll see some examples. About 25 to 30% of information is not found in books. And it's either found in two pages in a periodical or in a piece of paper that's in somebody's desk drawer that you're never gonna find, all right? Bible records, ancestry charts, events, new books, research tips, all kinds of different material in one periodical. This is actually the Detroit Society for, the Genealog for Genealogical Research. So Detroit, but what, as my example is, not just Wayne County is in there. If you look at the bottom of the white part, there's Macomb County, Michigan Deeds. So Detroit sits in Wayne County, but there's material in this Wayne County Detroit periodical that is not Wayne County. There's a listing of YMCA residents. There's tax assessment rolls for information. And if you look, there's mission deaths. The periodical, the publication date of the periodical has no relation to the information that's inside the periodical. So note just because it's Detroit, there's other stuff in there. There's how-to and ethnic articles. Let's not look at George Clooney, but let's look at the article about how to trace your Irish ancestors online. Ethnic magazines. Here's another ethnic magazine. This is Avutenu, the uh, Jewish genealogy periodical, which talks about a bunch of different things for the Holocaust in this issue. These are pictures of people that perished in, I think it's Birkenau. And then also there's a little basic type, typology of Ashkenazic Jewish surnames. I always knew that the YM Ashkenazic, but interestingly, it says when speaking of Jewish surnames, one must take into account the existence of specifically Jewish surnames and you see the variation in Kaufman. So this little type of information is just in these periodicals. There's also, you'll find illness or death information. This is Rhode Island roots. And in here, here's a smallpox in Providence from the time period of the revolution. Now, if you knew that people were dying, but you didn't know why during the revolution, maybe there was something that happened in the area where your family's from. And there happens to be a list of people that died of smallpox during that time period in Rhode Island roots. In, in the Indiana genealogist, um, some of you see me do this presentation before and I usually do part of it on Civil War amputees, but in the, in the Indiana genealogist, um, Kurt Witcher and I extracted from another document all the Indiana soldiers that received artificial limbs and put it into a periodical. So that again is something that came from a larger document into a smaller document. So how are you gonna find genealogy magazines? There is really one way to do it. There are a number of ways, but since we're at home, we're going with the virtual way to do it. <laughs> so Percy, the Periodical Source Index, has over 2.7 million entries and it is available for free at Find My Past. There's the website. It enables you to easily locate key information about people and places. And the majority of the articles are from periodicals that cover the United States and Canada, but you can also find thousands of genealogy and local history articles from it, both in England and, Fran and French from the United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia. And then on this homepage, 
Remember when we go to a web page and we look for that box to fill in the name, which is what we usually look for, sometimes it's beneficial to scroll down on the web page because at the Percy web page, there happen to be helpful videos on using Percy. So, all right, so here, discover the periodical source index. That's what everybody's looking for. So I decided to do a search. Now, I will say, that it's very cumbersome to use and it is not necessarily very user friendly, Percy. The best way to search is location. The best way to do is add a keyword. Then you're gonna note the article title and the periodical information, I'll show you a slide, and then you're gonna either contact us or you're gonna contact the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where Percy is generated and created. They have all the articles, we have a lot of the articles so you can always call us. So I am searching for, you can see that there's two ways. I, I'm searching for Illinois and Chicago and I use the optional keyword cemetery. The, you can browse the states and pick it as a filter or you can begin to type and it'll do the IntelliText, okay? I got 52 matches by putting that in. I did Illinois, Chicago, and Cemetery. I got 52 results. My results look like this. It is the name of the article, the subject, the periodical that comes in, the volume, the issue, and the publication date. So you can see that there's Chicago cemeteries. Here's Rose Hill Cemetery, persons of Scottish origin in Chicago. The magazine articles are not digitized. Some of them are if you have a personal subscription to Find My Past, but very few are. We have a subscription to Find My Past in the library, but it is a, not a remote database. So you have to search Percy and then you contact us. What we will need or what Fort Wayne will need is the article title, the periodical, the publisher, the publication date, the volume, and all that information. And you can get a hold of us and then we can copy the article for you and send it to you if you like, or you can contact Fort Wayne, which is the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So there's something for you to do virtually, which you might not have, which might engender some sort of, <laughs> since you can't get in. <laughs> so now I know that a lot of you know that we are, a library, not only are we a library affiliate, so you can see those images in the library, but we are also a digital partner of Family Search. So I wanted to remind you about this because as a digital partner, about 15,000 of our books, mostly pre-1924, are available at the Family Search Digital Library, which is at Family Search. You can click on books right across the top. You'll need to log in and you'll see images, but there are over 500,000 books available at the Family Search Digital Library. So if you go into our library catalog and you find a book, you should immediately go to Family Search. You should go out to Google. You should look to see if there is a digital image. If it's a recent book, chances are you're not going to find it. But if it's a family history, if it's books like this, this is Coles County in the Civil War. Here are family histories on family surnames. All right. Here is another book on the history of Salt Lake County, Utah. Here's a cemetery book. That has been that has been digitized and then also diaries so books that have been digitized might be able to help you so when you say you wish you could get into clayton or you wish you could get into dallas or if you're farther away and your library is still closed use family search try and put the title in google and see if it comes up in other digital components book projects that, that we have. I just wanted to, to highlight Family Search right now. So, as a takeaway, remember, you every column on the census report and digest, digest, is that how you say the same thing? You just say it differently? Digest, digest, digest. The information, where else does it lead? Look at, the, look at that information and take it and keep yourself busy. I know that you don't have anything else to do because of course we have 27,000 ancestors. What did your ancestor do? What records were created to help you find out about that profession, about payments? Remember periodicals hold about 25% of available knowledge. It can help break a brick wall. 
Percy's challenging, but worth it. And remember that if you need a library fix, you can go to Family Search. But always remember that although the doors are closed, we are here. We are here from 10 to 5 every day. You can call us. We will do limited reference assistance. So we ask that you formulate your research question. Who do you want to work on? What are you looking for? What do you want to know? We will do consultations with you. We'll have conversations with you, of course, just like as if you walked in and we'll do direct lookups if you have a book and you identify a book and you want us to do that. If you need a library card, you can get a library card, whoops, sorry. You can get a library card through our website if you live in Texas for free. If you live outside of Texas, you can still get a library card. It is $40 for a year, $20 for six months, and that will give you access to uh, remote access databases in our genealogy, which include MyHeritage, Ancestry Library Edition. We have a lot of other databases in social science and history. We have ebooks that are available. So, and then again, if you need us to come, I mean, we can do presentations on beginning genealogy, anything you like. We are still here. We are still here and we would love to talk to you. So, I hope that it gave you some information. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I am going to put in the chat. Um, let me get, here are the handouts. Because we forgot to do this beforehand. Let me see, how do I go back? How do I go back? Okay. <laughs> how do I go back? Let me, <laughs> let me go to the chat. Okay, so here, control V. Let's see. So stop sharing my stop sharing my screen. Oh, hi Jess. <laughs> so hang on, let me do the source checklist. So that's that handout. And here is the Zoom. Okay. So there are the two handouts. They are in a Dropbox folder and anybody with that should be able to get to them. So now, let's see, we're gonna do questions now, right? All right. Let's do, let's do some of the questions in chat first. We have, we, and then we'll come back to voice, okay? So Mitch is, Mitch is our, Mitch is our co-host. Mitch, would you like to read some questions? Sure, I have a question here from Teresa Rundle that says, what if you don't have Drawbox? As long as you have the link, you still should be able to open up the document. Because I gave everybody permission to, as long as you had the link, you should be able to do it. Yeah, Amanda Pape uh, agrees with that. She said that she was able to download without having a Dropbox account. Okay. So is there a way to access Hathi Trust as a partner affiliate? You can just go to Hathi Trust. It doesn't matter whether we are not a partner affiliate, but you should just, Hathi Trust is another one of those collection of digital material that will, it's a hub that will take you out to other places. And so here I can put my, put my video on so you can see me moving my hands. <laughs> it's one of those hubs <laughs> that takes you out to different places. So Happy Trust is another one that you should look also for other material. If you live in North Texas, yes, you still should be able to, apply, to obtain a library card. If you go to houstonlibrary.org, which is our website, in the upper left-hand corner, it says get a MyLink card. Just put your address in and you'll be ready. Okay, Sue. Uh, Ellen uh, says, don't forget to check Cindy's list online for links to many resource topics. And then uh, Elise, I guess it's Elise, 
uh, asks, can you, you access JSTOR with the MyLink library card? Yes, you can. JSTOR, JSTOR is another, is another, it's another periodical database, but there's the William and Mary Quarterly is there. Um, there's some Virginia magazines. So you can search by keyword or you can search by periodical title also. And JSTOR is available through our library databases. Okay, so uh, we have a question from uh, somebody named Nick. It says, uh, can we access the periodical articles on Find My Past at the library? Yeah, well, the answer would be yes. So if you find one that seems to be digitized on Find My Past, you would want to contact us too. There are very few digitized. That's why, and there's, there's a way to look for the periodicals in our, in our, in our research page of, of databases. I don't really want to go into it. If you, there's a link there that says Clayton periodicals. If you go to houstonlibrary.org, click on research, click on genealogy. There's a link in there that says Clayton periodical database. You can search the title in that database to see if we have the, if we have the issue that you want. If you don't understand anything I'm talking about right now, Call us and we'll walk through it with you while you're on the phone, while you're on the phone. Okay. You know, I mean, because it's, it's really hard to describe it. So. Okay, Sue, uh, Joy uh, just posted a link to JSTOR for people. Um, uh, Linda uh, reminds people to uh, check out the Digital Public Library as a great resource as well. Um, and then uh, Melinda is asking, is there any special access to materials because of the uh, COVID? What I'm wondering, what do you mean by special access? That's what I wonder. I'm thinking possibly if you're thinking of uh, like the family history centers or something, um, since you can't go to a family history center to view uh, records, are they making any changes to that policy? Are they making any changes to that policy? No, 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 they're not making any changes to any policy. So if you can't get anything digitally and we have access to it, you're going to need to contact us. But you know, right. But there is some special uh, things being done. Uh, Ancestry Library Edition is available at home now. Right. Yeah, so library, so that's right. So Mitch just mentioned, so through our library website, Ancestry Library Edition, which you can get through the research page for genealogy, is available through August 31st if you do not have your own personal subscription for Ancestry. Remember, we always used to say you had to come in to use Ancestry. Well, ProQuest is making it available through August. Okay, and Liz uh, is asking you not to forget the death certificate coding. Oh, the death certificate coding. Yeah, so the death certificate coding. Let me see what I can find. Just keep, so are there any more questions that I can answer at the same time while I'm doing this? I'm done. <laughs> what is the easiest way to start researching ancestors from France? Mitch, why don't you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> or does anybody else have any ideas? Family search. <laughs> Okay, now Joy has also posted a link to the uh, Clayton Library periodical database. So if you do find something in uh, Percy um, that is interest of you, you can see if we have a copy of it here. And then uh, Marguerite asks, can I find the insane asylum record from the state hospital at San Antonio from 1920? You would have to, I would look at the Texas State Library and Archives website. That would be my suggestion. 
would that be too recent for that kind of a record? Well, I have a feeling it's going to be closed. I, I have a feeling, but I would, Melissa, do you have any, any other ideas? Okay, so it's the international causes of death. Joy wrote this, okay, and let me see. So the website is wolfbane.com, like wolfbane, like what is that, the wolfman, wolfbane, W-O-L-F-B-A-N-E. Dot com. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay. So, <clears throat> see wolfbane.com. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, wolfbane.com. And as an example, Let's see, where is, so can you still see my screen or what are you seeing now? Let's see, you have to share each screen differently. So Joy found, here's an example of a death certificate. See this death certificate that has that number on it, 189, can you see that Mitch? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So this 189, there's no cause of death. And if you were on, and there might be Patsy, I don't know who was on with the Clayton Library Friends the other day, but those numbers are explained in this international list causes of death, and they're also used for medical transcription. Could somebody who brought it up the other day when I was talking about it talk about this? Like somebody unmute. Jessica, do you remember who was talking about it? Who was talking about that they did medical transcription? I am going to put a link into the chat. Oh, Mitch, you need to open up mics. Medical, okay, Linda Collins, medical coding and building. Linda, can you unopen, let's see, ask to unmute. Linda Collins, ask to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, 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 Linda, yeah. yeah the ICD-10 uh, is the version that's currently in use, and it's a listing of, um, many, many details about medical diagnoses, and it's used for medical coding and then ultimately for medical billing, and it's still in use today. Uh, but the list you showed us was from the very beginning, and so mm -hmm. I think you said you have to make sure to look for the version that was in use during the time of the death certificate that you're looking at. Um, our other, Patsy, you can talk, uh, the mics are open now. Okay, I just added the link to the CDC uh, document about the ICD-10. It doesn't have all, it doesn't have a list of the codes, but it has lots of examples of from death certificates of how the codes are used. And um, 
when I, and I Googled to find that. And when I did, there was, um, uh, here's the international list here. Yeah. The Wolfbane address came up mm -hmm. and, but you can also do it like what were, what were the death codes uh, on for 1930? You can yeah. Google a specific year. There are get, there were other revisions. So Patsy's making the point that you got to look and see when the death certificate occurred and when the what revision the international list cause of death is. Okay, here's the Wolfbane. Mm -hmm. uh, address. I'll put, I'll paste that in. Okay. And it does have, it's just a list of codes and causes of, and what that code means in terms of the, and it says it's revision three, which I don't know what revision, I don't know what year that is, but, oh, let me, there it is. And then Lisa mentions that it shows the 10 revision years. So that was something when you look at it, you have to look at the year of the death certificate and look at the year of the revision because if the death certificate was in 1923 and there was a revision in 1930, you wanna look at the revision that was prior to 1930 so you're getting the right number. Play around with it and send us an email if you don't know, if you can't figure it out. Um, Diane, Diane mentioned about obtaining Illinois State Penitentiary records from the Illinois Archives. Yes, Diane, I have done the same thing. And other state archives might have prison jail records. The answer to that is yes. The Texas State Library has prison and jail records, but then also the Texas prison records have been digitized at Ancestry. So do, the, do those keyword search for prison in the Ancestry catalog, and then also on the historical records page, and then in the catalog at Family Search and type in the word prison and see what's there. So it's five, does anybody have any last questions or any other comments? It's great to see so many names of everybody. <laughs> we miss you all. <laughs> we miss you miss all. you too. <laughs> but call us, even if you just want to talk to us. <laughs> We're still providing the, the, psycho, the cheapest psychological counseling around. So <laughs> by all means, call us. And I hope that, I mean, it, it's a little odd to do these, and I know I might have been a little disoriented, but like I said, you know, I mean, the phone number is available, and if you don't know anything, or I mean, if you don't, if you're not clear on anything, um, you know, the Houston Library number for genealogy, let me put up that last slide again, and we can see it all so I can show you our slide and then you can have it and you can call us let's see we're going to share the screen mitch and i are so excited we figured we figured out how to share screens so i could see something let's see so there's so there's our phone numbers and there's our e our phone number and our email and so you can ask for any of us. I mean, if you call, you know, you can ask for one of us or, you know, and then we're still, you know, it's just like we're still feeding off of one another and, and knowing and helping everybody. So we would love to, you know, be your feet for you in the building and help you in any way that we can. So remember fourth Friday, the Clayton Library friends have a, a Thursday meetup at two o'clock um, through Zoom, and if you go to the Clayton Library Friends webpage, which is ClaytonLibraryFriends.org, or visit their Facebook page, which is Clayton Library Friends Facebook, you can sign up for those. Patsy, yes? Patsy, did you have a, a, a question or something? Oh, she can't unmute. Can you I, unmute? I, okay. Not me this time. No, let's see. Mute all. 
Allow participants to unmute themselves. Now try. Okay, my question, can you hear me now? Yes. My question was, can we register for the, for the Friday sessions as a series or do we have to register for each one individually? Each one individually, I believe. Justin, is that correct? Justin is our program. Yes. Okay. Each one, will, you will have to uh, register individually the same way you registered for this one. So the way you can find out about them is, number one, we are going to be sending out our monthly programming sheet again, so you need to sign up for our electronic newsletters which are, let's see, that's the first thing. Okay, you can sign up for our electronic newsletter. The second thing is on our library website, you'll see it, you'd also be on the Clayton Library Friends page, Facebook page, their web page, um, but on our library website, if you click on calendar, can you see my, you got my, my, the library homepage? Yes. Okay, if you click on calendar, see where it says virtual events. And once I can scroll down, my, my mouse has gone to another, oh, it's gone to, anyway, you scroll down, okay? I can't scroll down because for some reason my, oh, I'm, you're still showing my, if you go to the uh, internet page and scroll down, that should stroll, scroll down on Zoom. Okay, I hear, yeah, okay, all right, there, here we go. I just, I'm, I'm, okay, see, so here, here's this one. So to go to our library web page, you go to houstonlibrary.org, click on calendar, that opens up virtual events. You'll see it there, okay? We also have an electronic newsletter which I can never find it. Joy? Is that the one that comes through our email? Yes, it comes through your email. Learn and explore. I will put our link to our email newsletters on the Clayton Library Friends webpage. It's just super cumbersome to try and find. But to find out, so remember it's the fourth Friday, but at least you can still go to calendar and then scroll down and watch for virtual events. So the fourth Fridays. And Sue. Yes. Uh, if you, in virtual events, if you put genealogy in the, in the search events, then it'll clear out every, a lot of the other events and just bring up the genealogy events. It's a lot easier to go through the calendar then. Thanks, Madeline. And search our website, right? Right. In the, on the virtual events page. Okay. No, back to the virtual events page. Yeah. Oh, here. Oh, okay. Yeah. And just put genealogy in there. That's how I do uh, monthly list every month when I was okay. in it. But I will put our link to our newsletter because we would love to have you sign up if you don't get our newsletter. In addition to being a member of the Clayton Library Friends, which of course you will get their newsletter also. So it's 302. I hope it was okay, you guys. I mean, it's thank goodness Melissa and, and Mitch were in here so I wasn't talking to a stuffed animal. <laughs> which is what I normally do when I don't have anybody else around. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah, you. it was great. Oh. Thank you so much. Oh, listen, you. email us, you guys. It's great to see a lot of you, all right? Thanks thank you, Susan. Hey, Sue, can I, can I ask you one more question? Uh, we have a couple people asking if this is going to be recorded and posted somewhere. Yes. Yes, where? 
So this is what we have done is, is we're recording this. And at this point, we, are, we will be mounting it up to the HPL YouTube page eventually. And we will let you know when this happens, because that's the purpose of, of doing these, is we begin to create this webinar library. So yes, so my job right now is, is you're gonna go to the Clayton Library Friends webpage, probably tomorrow or the next day, and you'll see a list there for how to get our electronic newsletter. And then once we get these mounted and permanent on YouTube, we will send it through our newsletter and we'll also send it through the Clayton Library Friends. Remind people about saving the chat. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Nick, can you tell us how to save the chat? Yes, I can. Oh. Um, down in the chat uh, area, there's a three dots in the lower right. And you click on the three dots, and then it'll open up and say save chat. And then I you did. click on save chat. I did it. So oh, she was muted, but <laughs> I kind of heard her. If you got any questions for us, call us because we would love to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Mitch.